Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk. Uh, these talks are live every Friday at 1 p.m., both here in the building and live online. Uh, so if you're in Bristol or you're far away, you can join in the conversation. My name is Martin O'Leary. I'm the studio community lead. Uh, I'm a white man in my late 30s with long hair and a beard, wearing a baby blue uh, jumper that my mum bought me for Christmas. Um, every Friday we throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday and we offer you the chance to spend some time in our space hot desking alongside our residents and staff from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So a especially big welcome for those of you who are new to the studio. I'm seeing a lot of faces I don't recognize. How many of you are new to the studio? And in the air? Yeah. Welcome to all of you. Uh, it's really nice. So for you, uh, what is the Pervasive Media Studio? Uh, we're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. Uh, we're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol, and we're funded by Arts Council England. Um, we offer studio space, desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities to our residents as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And mostly we're a space for people to take risks in their practice, embryonic ideas, and to make time for collaboration. So quick bit of housekeeping. Feel free to move around, not at school. Just get up, go make a cup of tea, grab a glass of water, whatever you want. Please don't use the microphone. It interferes with the induction loop, which some people may be using. We have a quiet space just through this wall here. So if you need to take a break at any point, just pop around the corner. Um, fire exits. We are not expecting a fire alarm. If it happens, that's real. Uh, so one of the studio team will direct you to the fire exits, which are at either end of the building on the other side. Um, and accessible toilets and baby change are in the corridor just over there next to the kitchen. There's going to be a Q&A at the end of the talk. And so if you're watching online, pop your questions into the YouTube chat. If you're in the building, you just raise your hand in the old fashioned way. You can get news on all of our future talks. Head to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio at PM Studio UK on Twitter at Pervasive Media Studio at Mastodon.social on Mastodon if you hate Twitter for some reason. Some reason. Um, <laughs> and, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. But now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Harriet Hand is a designer, educator, and researcher with a background in the field of wayfinding design. Uh, last year, as part of her PhD research at the University of Bristol, she worked with a group of local 17-year-olds downstairs here in Studio 5 to explore map making as a tool for making sense of ourselves in relation to the complexity of the everyday. And today she's going to share what emerged in that space and reflect on the potential of unreliable tools for, for learning. So please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to Harriet. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to start, kick off with this photograph. It was sent by a friend of mine, um, Andrew Painter, last week. And I kind of found myself going back to it and, uh, and sort of sitting with it, thinking about um, the relationship between the child and the painting. And I sort of thought, well, I'm not seeing him as separate. I sort of see him as part of that painting. And, um, and I suppose I then thought about how you could probably have two takes on the image that you could see him as quite passive and vulnerable to this really big, dynamic, um, huge kind of thing that he's looking at. Or you could see him as vulnerable in another sense, so as, as him, him as open and kind of curious and part of the potential of what could become out of what's happening in that sort of movement. And, um, and I thought this was kind of a good way to sort of kick off because it sort of helps me to share a little bit about my stance and what I'm interested in in my research, which is getting a better understanding of how we can make space for young people to engage with the complexity and the dynamic nature of the world and, um, and through that process make sense of the world and themselves at the same time. So one of the problems that I'm sort of thinking about in education, and, and I'm sort of thinking more specifically um, in my project uh, about um, sort of 16, 17, 18 year olds, but I think this is probably applicable to primary and secondary education, is that the more we kind of want to measure and standardize things so that we can kind of account for the success and the quality of what we're delivering and, um, and produce results that, are, that yeah, are measurable, the more we kind of put um, this emphasis on what we think of as reliable tools. So what we're looking for in education seems to be more and more about things, ways of doing things that are trusted, 
that we can rely on, that we have confidence in what they're going to produce, that they're consistently good. We can depend on them to give us results that we recognise, that we can, um, even if we repeat that method, um, it will give us that consistent result. And that problem that I'm sort of thinking about makes me think how that way of organising and engaging with the world doesn't really leave much space for understanding what that painting kind of was doing, that sort of dynamic, more complex version of the world. And by reducing that sort of complexity, I'm sort of thinking about what we're missing out on, what the children are missing out on in terms of becoming adult um, in a world that's going to, uh, not only for something for them to understand, but for them to sort of be part of transforming. My background, as Martin said, is in wayfinding. So I've worked for um, most of my sort of adult life as a designer, designing maps uh, for cities. And map making, map, map making for me um, is a really interesting process of understanding place. And I was interested in what it might offer as a tool in research, sort of working with young people in schools. So. Um, since I became a teacher uh, a number of years ago, I've used map making in different ways. And my definition is a bit loose. So because maps, I think, mean different things for different people in different contexts, I don't, can't really give you like a fixed definition. Um, but I see it as a base for six weeks. The students came every week. So there's a group of 10, 17 year olds from Cotton, from the North Bristol Post 16 Centre. And they came once a week and we made maps and we talked about making maps. and. Um, we added them to the wall and we talked about our everyday lives and it all kind of worked in a very sort of emergent way. So uh, my approach to research was speculative and um, disappointingly, I think, for my supervisors, I never really got to a, a research question. The nearest I got was what does map making do? <laughs> so um, it was quite experimental and people visited. So I know there are people here that saw the space and... Um, those people also mapped sometimes and added things to the walls. And it was kind of a collective dialogue um, that helped us explore the possibilities of mapping. I'm going to share some of those moments. I'm pleased to say that I'm very grateful to the students um, for allowing me to share images. And for this talk, I want to sort of advocate for trusting in unreliable ways of working. So, I sort of took the opportunity of speaking today to think about the nature of unreliable tools in, in respect to the map making and offer a few kind of hopefully um, some insights into, into what emerged from that thinking. So first of all, I wanna, um, I'm going to explore three things related to those definitions that I showed earlier. So um, whereas reliable tools um, can be trusted, I'm going to say that map making is not possible to trust. Um, you can't trust what will happen. There's no safety in um, what will be produced, and it might not be what you expect. One of the first map making uh, activities we did, I called it personal geographies. I kind of asked the students to map um, their home area, kind of how they imagined it in their mind. It's based on a technique that's commonly used amongst um, social scientists and um, wayfinding designers and uh, urbanists. And I thought it was a good way into mapping because it's kind of mapping a place. So I think it felt kind of comfortable. And the students um, spent time uh, drawing, mapping their, mapping their areas. And then really quickly, they, um, it was just clear they wanted to share stories. So they started talking about the nursery they went to when they were a kid and sort of walks with their families or um, the playground where they got their foot stuck in a toy train once and the hospital and the mosque that's no longer there. Um, and these sort of memories of past and present all kind of were entangled in these stories and it was all um, the physical and the kind of virtual all kind of came together. But what was really interesting as well for me were the kind of gaps and the boundaries and the kind of recognition of separate things which were happening in space. So you can see this map, for example, has this big hole, which is actually Montpellier, <laughs> um, the neighbourhood. <laughs> and, um, and it just stories were really inspiring and I wanted to try and find a way of kind of getting the stories into the maps. And I think this is one of the qualities of map making which makes it unreliable is that it's not a in it kind of emerges out of 
um, multiple kind of middles. And I used a technique called reduction. So reduction is um, used by a number of artists. I was kind of inspired by the artist Tom Phillips who uses this method. And I asked the students just to kind of look at what speaks to them, what matters to them in the stories and to cross out everything else. And they did that with these texts so that we could um, look at ways of, of the stories becoming part of the maps. Um, where I hang out with my friends, family, like where I live, where's like the important to me. In the pandemic, that was a really, like, I can't uh, home at all because I'm trying to be to what I do something that is supposed to be rather than just this is where this is and this is where the other thing is and um, I think I'm not told really how helps. I get to school and get that. As I'm getting older, like things are getting closer and closer. So like my mum took me to McDonald's and that's kind of when I realised, oh okay, this is Bristol and that's that we uh, like this is normal Bristol and my gosh. Like, like, how many places I know I remember wow. like, Yeah, I used to go there like, mm. like, like personal spaces, then mm. you kinda of block out everything else. Yeah. just wanted to, for the students to kind of to be in the room a bit as well and to show you that process. Um, to transfer uh, the words to the maps, I introduced the technique of carbon paper, so copy paper, which um, if you're not familiar, it's a sheet that if you put between two sheets of normal paper and you write on the top layer, it transfers through kind of an, it's like an inky sheet onto the bottom paper, so commonly used for typewriting, as you can see. Um, and I also introduced at this point a set of cards called Oblique Strategies, which are produced by Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt. And these sort of techniques that I sort of see them as positive disruptions, I sort of use them intentionally because I'm aware that sometimes we need to be jogged out of our normal ways, practice ways of working. And I saw them as ways of kind of pushing maybe a little bit of chance, letting a gap to open up for something to happen that we might not... Um, that we might kind of accept as, as an unexpected um, happening. So those two techniques um, were happening in, in the time that the students were transferring their words onto the maps. The student that had kind of introduced their map as um, Somalia in Bristol had the card that read, do the words need changing? And I think what was really interesting to me was through this process of kind of creating a spatial image of where they lived and thinking about the memories and thinking about their sense of identity in terms of their home self and their learner self or their self when they're kind of in the city. Um, it felt to me that the boundary was getting dissolved a little by this sort of change in words. So she, the words became brain and heart and she talked about them being connected and working in the same way. And I saw this as a moment where the students were sort of engaging with ideas which were sort of almost holding kind of two contradictory things or things they might have thought of as contradictory, kind of seeing a relationship between them. Another example is this map from a student that um, had kind of their stories about where they lived um, really centred around their experiences during lockdown, which is natural. These students were um, in year 10 when the um, pandemic started, so they're really kind of among... I guess because they had GCSEs and then going into A-level really affected their um, quite a stressful time already in their lives. And, and uh, they talked a lot about not seeing friends, the anxiety of not seeing um, their colleagues from school and learning online, and then their anxiety of seeing people kind of going out into the world and feeling um, feelings of safety. And the word that by chance that landed next to the coronavirus was appreciative, and it was a really interesting moment um, when that happened, they said some things completely different overlapped. And through how the story evolved, it wasn't that they were saying how they felt was wrong or that, um, that it kind of like, it meant that they couldn't have felt those stories from before. It was more that they were able to sort of understand that it was more complicated than they thought and they were able to talk about the kind of coexisting contradiction that it had been a very difficult experience, but also a time when they'd appreciated what they had and appreciated things in their lives that they hadn't done before. So I think that unreliableness comes from the kind of open nature of map making. These types of maps kind of don't have, they've got paths that aren't finished, they've got areas which are incomplete, and it's almost as if they can just carry on map making 
uh, through that relationship between the person mapping the world and the piece of paper. The second quality I wanted to talk about, um, so reliable things which are consistently good at what we think are, is quality or um, a dependable kind of result. I want to think about how map making produced things which might not be recognisable as good or correct. This is a different activity. So I'm sort of quite interested in how we could use sort of place-based map making, but to look at relationships between things that aren't necessarily place-based. So I asked the students to think about their journey into their A-levels, kind of if they imagined it, their lives as a, some sort of terrain, what were the features that kind of enabled them to navigate towards doing mathematics or chemistry or business studies, BTEC, or the other subjects, REP, that they were studying. At the time, I didn't really expect what was going to happen. So now I think about it, it seems like it might actually be quite obvious they were going to do this, but they all produced timelines. So they all produced maps which were based on a sequence of events. And, um, and as you can see here, one of the students is, is drawing out. So even if they weren't aligned, all of the maps were based on kind of what happened in year three in primary or what happened when I was a kid and I used to draw eyes all the time and that inspired something. And it, it was really fascinating to me that this structure just came really quickly to them. Um, so year seven, year eight, Commonly, it would be year 9, year 10, year 11, year 12, the future. So it was kind of like <laughs> quite interesting that um, the future had been condensed into this kind of single next step. Um, now, the stories were really similar. So they talked about what they loved when they were kids and what their parents did or a friend they knew. They talked about um, teachers they liked and that they'd chosen their subjects because they loved the teacher. They talked about teachers they didn't like, and that they didn't do that subject because they didn't like the teacher. Um, there were lots of stories from the past, from childhood. So it's really similar to the, the mapping I spoke about before, the personal geographies. But this time, what they had in front of them was like a closed structure. So I couldn't see how those stories could... How, where those stories were in what they'd produced. What they'd produced was very much, I did this, I did this, we were asked to choose this, we chose this, you know, this kind of reduction that happens as you go towards um, post-16 education or um, after GCSEs into uh, apprenticeships and jobs. It's almost like a, this sort of formula. And that's what kind of, um, that's what the structure offered. And so... I went away, I felt quite unsettled by this. I had a, a strong drink with a friend of mine, uh, Jill, in the Watershed Cafe afterwards, because I just felt like something had been stifled in terms of their experiences, and I felt like the map making hadn't really allowed for um, the students' kind of emotions, sort of the things that were outside of what's a sort of top-down structure that they're, they're part of, that sort of rhythm of education. Uh, I think that slide, actually, just to draw attention to the, a quote which I really liked, which was, um, it was about narratives and about how chronological structures tend to make the world a lot simpler than it really is. Um, and it's a way of convincing ourselves that life is simple, which I thought was an interesting observation. So during this time, when I'm in the room, uh, when the students aren't there, I do a lot of reading. And um, I was reading a book called Curation by Jens Hoffman. And as a curator, I guess in exhibitions, I think that they were talking about the idea of collapsing time. I think that was a quote. And it was about, and I sort of imagined this exhibition where it wouldn't be in chronological order and that time would be much more sort of plural and, and um, the relationships would be based on other things. So I took that idea of collapsing time and I gave this instruction. This is an example of the instructions I gave the students, which were very short, sometimes ambiguous. Um, and I tried not to say anything. I tried to let them interpret those in their own way. So by asking them to cut up the maps, I gave them a photocopy because I thought it might be a bit um, stressful to think that they were cutting up the originals. Um, by cutting up the maps, they looked for other relationships. So um, they were finding other relations within the same material that had created those timelines. 
And they also worked really instinctively. So they picked up pens, they used the other tools in the room, which were quite basic tools, so only red and black. And, um, and, but they used those to kind of express things that came out of the stories they'd been telling. When the maps were put on the wall afterwards, one of the visitors to the space sort of made an observation, which I really liked, um, which was they felt there was this line between the timelines and then the, um, the maps that had been cut up, which was almost like a moment in time where the students had been given permission, sort of given permission to do something which they hadn't been conditioned to, um, was the language that she used. And I think that was a really interesting idea, this idea that we need to give young people permission to kind of um, to interpret things and to express things in a way that, um, that they want to about the world. So this is an example of one of the, um, the maps. And I think that kind of unreliableness of having an open structure and of having a, a space to look at relationships between things caused something to emerge which hadn't happened before. In this case, it was a critical stance to their education, which was the same for a couple of the other students. So rather than it being, you know, this happened, this happened, this happened, suddenly emotions got involved and a kind of an account of their education story which wasn't the official one it was almost like an unofficial story that was going on underneath and I really sensed that this kind of expression helped them to make sense of what they were going through what they were part of um, and there was a real sort of sense of them kind of discovering something about the system of education but also about themselves and about their futures um, the future wasn't kind of like a the next <coughs> step in the process they started to open up that as a set of possibilities for themselves There were nice little happy coincidences like happyology as a potential <coughs> subject to study at university. So, you know, this idea of kind of being freer with the materials, um, the materials got involved. And I think it's that idea as well that the students started to appreciate this sort of not having control. This actual session, one of the students said that they found it the most relaxed. And I think it was that idea that actually the control has been taken away in some respects. And it's much more of a collaboration between sort of the, the human, the material, and the space going on. I think, to finish on this point, I think reliable tools for me, because they're so focused on outcome, you know, it, it's a tool devised to produce something that what's unreliable about mapping is, in this way, is that it's not the outcome we're aiming for, it's the process of doing it. And I think that sort of unreliableness of how that process will play out will involve the person, involve their personality. So you won't produce things which are identical and you won't necessarily produce things that you would consider to be good or of quality, um, those kind of normal criteria. So um, what was important to me here was that the students were producing things which didn't depend on language alone. There's a lot expressed in these maps, I think, which isn't about the words, it's about something else, um, the gesture, the, the mark making. So the last example um, is sort of addressing this idea that reliable things can be repeated to give consistent results. And um, the example I'm going to use to show that things um, that are repeated never produce the same <laughs> is, uh, is another type of map making we did outside here. The idea for the activity came from me layering maps. And this is really um, familiar to my practice as a mapping and he sort of talks about hybrid games so the idea that once those layers are there you can start to create new things from a combination and I really like that idea and the students really engaged with this in fact one of them there were two maps they put together and the girl that had left a big hole in her, her map somebody else's map filled that hole and she kind of declared you complete me which at the time was genuinely very funny um, <laughs> So for this um, activity, the next activity, I was, um, I was interested in chance again, like maybe distancing the students a bit. I think what happened when the maps were laid was that suddenly it wasn't about their personal experiences. It became more of a, collect, a sense of collective experience of the city. And it kind of distanced that idea of the person, the personal. Um, and to think about that idea, I 
borrowed a technique that a friend, Nick Durrant, had shared with me to create a dice, a dodecahedron. And the students went round the room and they, I asked them just to put on each cell what mattered to them on the wall. So they read things on the wall, they added them to the dice so that these dice became ways of thinking about um, their walk. Um, so they rolled the dice, the, the word that came up, I asked them to go out and map that word. I asked them to take an inventory of that word. So if they got the word um, nostalgia or connected, I, I said, I want you to take an inventory of that word and we're going to walk around this harbour area. We just walked out around here because it was, I'd never done this before. So I think I was like, let's keep it small and uh, manageable. So I gave them, uh, so it felt like an inventory. I gave them a clipboard and some sticky dots and a pen. And we set off and they walked and made notes that when they saw something that they felt mattered to that word, uh, they made a note of it. So I quite like this idea of inventory because I don't see it as wholly sort of um, quantitative. I don't see it as just counting up what you've got. I sort of see it as at the same time, you're kind of assessing what you have and you're, and you're caring about it as well. And you're getting a whole p holistic picture by doing those inventories. So. Um, I found it really nice to sort of think about how they were each thinking about different elements as we walked around this area. And it definitely worked to kind of distance their own personal experience as well. Although they did include their personal experience in the maps. Um, it was a different kind of map that emerged. When we got back, they um, added them to the wall. And what came out of the conversation was that they were talking about their appreciation of the different lives in Bristol. So how Bristol is different for different people and how they viewed things weren't necessarily how other people viewed things. And they described it as different stories about the same thing. And this really interested me, this idea about um, appreciating that there's different versions of the present. Tim Ingold, the anthropologist, sort of talks about this, um, about being a collective life, a sort of sense of collective life, which I, th I thought was really interesting. So again, I layered them, and, I, and what I wanted to do was to see if um, we could think more about um, what was being made possible by mapping in this way and having this sort of sense of collective. And I think it came up again, a bit like the COVID and appreciation. It was like almost like we were able to hold things that were different, but still connected, and what was important to you. And through the process of the kind of, of the of the mapping and, and actually towards the end of the research, it felt almost like something which had come out of all the activities was this sort of ethical sensibility to the world. So students talked about empathy and sort of understanding and what I think I want to describe as a kind of sense of kinship that this kind of mapping had given them um, in terms of engaging with the world by, by just stepping a little bit out of their own personal kind of experiences. So by exploring those three kind of moments in the research, I really wanted to sort of share what I um, share my thinking around what it might mean to use learning tools that are unreliable. And one of the students um, in the research said that working out different stories might be a good way of learning. This is her, them talking, it might be a good way of learning. Instead of being given one thing, do that thing, only that thing. My education feels like it's looking at the same things on repeat. So I want to advocate for kind of unreliable ways of working about not, I'm not saying reliable, um, it's not an either or situation for me, it's kind of both together. I, I just sort of see that education, that we need to be thinking about ways of opening it up again so that there is space for students to engage with um, the complexity and the dynamic nature of the world and be part of sort of transforming that world as well, um, that they have the capacity to do it and that education shouldn't stifle that capacity. Um, I want to say thank you to the students first because they're really generous and thoughtful in joining um, the research and contributing. And I, I've got a very small website where I'm starting to bring ideas together. So if you're interested, um, you can see some of the work there.
I'm obviously drawing upon a lot of other people's ideas and I'm really aware that a lot of these practices are kind of common to arts pedagogy as well. Um, so there's a list here if you'd like to know what I'm reading. I've just put some of the key things on a sheet of paper you can get. And um, this is in progress, so like, I'm really happy to hear what's resonated or what's of interest. And, but if you've got questions as well, I'll try hard to answer them. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet. Oh, we have questions already. Uh, if you're in the room, stick your hand in the air. If you're online, put it in the chat and Danielle will pick it out. I've got a microphone here. It's not for in the room, it's for the people online. Hello. Bonjour, Harriet. Hello. Hi, Anne. Um, Is it actually <laughs> oh. Yeah, for online, not okay. for in the room. Bonjour, people online. Bonjour. Um, <laughs> Just a very simple question. I'd love to do your workshop. Are you intending to do one for <laughs> adults, for expats, like, uh, <laughs> like me being lost in the Brexit to find the mapping? It really moved me more than I thought oh. um, in terms of the connection, how actually the timeline is much deeper. I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't think that I would find an interest in this talk. But um, I ended up like having to take all my notebook and and yeah, I'd love to do it because there's so much depth into your own sto story and so that's it. Simple question: Thank Are you, you doing uh, a <laughs> workshop for human beings who are lost in the world like me? <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, and listening and um, yeah I mean I fully intend to continue so many ideas have come out of what I've done and I was talking to a colleague of mine who's here Michael and different potentials <laughs> for mapping I mean I'm not as I say like it won't surprise you I'm not interested in doing the same thing again but it's I'm interested in the potentials of it sort of related to thinking about futures I'm interested in mapping in relation to sort of disrupting maybe the past. I'm interested in using archive maps. So some of the maps I did was actually cutting up archive maps of Bristol and reconfiguring the city. And so those things, so I'm really interested. So maybe I should like, I'll start a little list. And if you want to be like contacted for future things, I'd be really happy. Yeah. Uh, what I meant, I didn't mean to be rude uh, by not coming. It's just, I didn't think I'd have the brain for it. <laughs> It's just because I know how it sounded very intellectual. I said, oh my goodness, I don't think I'm going to be able to uh, understand that. It's too much. Oh, uh, well. So merci very much for opening my, uh, oh. making me feel a bit more clever today. Merci. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, hi, thanks. That was a really beautiful demonstration and iterative process as well. It was really wonderful. Uh, just a really small question was when you were talking about the redacting what was the prompt that you were kind of using for that in terms of like what were they what were they doing to being asked to do yeah, yeah so one of the things we used in the whole space um was the notion of wonder and it maggie mcclure talks about this she's a social scientist and i used in fact i had a whole wall called the wonder wall which was at the end of every workshop and whenever anyone visited i just said what speaks to you what moves you in the room photograph it or write it and add it to that wall. And we didn't discuss it and I didn't really. Um, and so I really used that with the, with the redaction. I kind of said, look at what's speaking to you, what matters to you, um, and leave only those words. Yeah. I, they needed a bit of encouragement. Yeah. They left too much and I could see, and I didn't want to manage the technique. In fact, most of this, the mapping, I'm kind of doing it with them. I sort of sit down with my paper and I make my own maps because as a kind of demonstration of trust that they can get on and do it. But I did need to prompt them. I needed to say, be bold, you know, take risks, like cross out more than you think. Yeah. Hi, Harriet. Um, actually, I had a quick follow-up question to that one. But I, my, I didn't understand what the text was that they were redacting from. Was it okay. text they'd written or was it? So when they were telling stories of their maps, I recorded them. We had a little recorder in the oh, middle of right. the desk. Okay. And I transcribed just a portion of what they'd said in their stories and gave them that back the next week. And I said, this is a piece of text that's written from what you, you told in your stories, which they found really embarrassing. Um, <laughs> But I gave them that to redact. Yeah, sorry, I didn't make that clear. No, cool, thank you. Um, 
My actual question, though, um, and thank you. I, it was a really wonderful talk, and I'd also love to be your student, please. Um, <laughs> It was quite. It was interesting and almost quite jarring to hear your first point, particularly, I guess, because you were working with a group of 17-year-olds as inviting them into a process which you were saying had no safety in it. And that was a very like particular word that jumped out to me. And I was just interested to know, because at the same time, the, it's clear there's so much care for them in your process and in... And so I was wondering how you balance that notion of a process without safety with um, care for them. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a really big part of my research is the sort of ethical questions around researching with, with anyone, not just young people, but the process. So I sort of see ethics as care. So Nell Noddings talks about care and I don't see it as a procedural thing. I think all that procedural part is really important and I balance the two. So behind all of this is huge numbers of consent forms and talking to the school and risk assessment and all of those documents that I take really seriously. But I also knew that I needed to develop some trust. Um, part of that was you know, the space as well. So the space is really exposed and so I made sure that I brought them to the space before they signed the consent form. So just details like that, making sure that they knew where they would be. I told them I couldn't tell them what it would be like, but I showed them the materials. So I showed them that it's just a few pens and some paper and uh, some post-it notes and a tin of biscuits. And, um, you know, and, I, and I, I think I just tried from the beginning to have that honesty. I had to always give them the opportunity to opt out. And actually, the space ended up, I thought how the space actually is great, because they could just walk out. Like, if they're, you know, they really don't want to be part of it anymore. And I said that to them. You know, I always made it clear that it was voluntary. Um, I offered them to come today. I always offered them. They came to one presentation in the space. Um, and if, if anyone, any of them are listening, I really, I, you know, I'd love to hear what they think. And we are going to meet up a few of them. So that, that to me is, I'm grateful that that shows that they had some trust. I think it's about sort of sharing a bit of this picture, that sort of sense with them that we don't know how the world is, is going to be. We, we can't control it. And so, you know, it's open. It's not it's not risky in terms of danger, it's just risky in terms of actually giving ourselves permission to explore things together. Um, and I was conscious that if anything got very difficult, and you know, so I suppose it's like looking at body language and how they're behaving. Quite often I gave them, um, so I never asked direct questions, this was a technique as well. I gave, there were lots of questions that if somebody came to the room and asked a question, I'd kind of make a card out of it and then added it. And I said, oh, there's some more questions from people. So when we'd finished map making, I'd say, go and choose a question. And you can either write it on a sticky note or you can go and record it. And a few of the students just really liked taking one of the audio recorders and going off. There's this funny little room that we called the tech room. And they went off and did it themselves. So I never heard them talking. So I never gave them that sense of having to perform as well, and I think that was part of um, developing that sort of atmosphere of um, mutual trust, I think. Yeah, those are some examples. Thanks. We got a question from online. Um, we've got a two-part question from Brendan Arnold, who's watching online. They've said, I've just come back from field trips talking to people using maps to understand how people view their land now and in the future. Um, what did you think map making access is that more reliable techniques wouldn't? And then the second part of the question, when making mental maps, do you think people make more interesting mental maps when they are in situ versus when they are drawing from memory? That's really interesting. I remember both those questions. I'm going to answer the second one first, I think. So... Um, I think it would produce different results. In, so I've done both in situ and from memory, um, mostly in work for design, for uh, wayfinding design. I'd say you probably get quite different results because people in situ are picking up visual cues which might feel important to them in the moment. Like that building, I'm looking out the window at a big um, building over there, Broadkey House. 
that feels really important to me in the moment. But if I wasn't here, that building wouldn't even figure on my radar. So it it's, would depend on what's interesting to you. And I think that, that could draw out either kind of how the city was designed by planners versus kind of your emotional and kind of um, memory of somewhere. And Danielle, please remind me what the first question was just quickly and then I'll... Um, it was to do with um, what differences. Did, um, what did you think map making access is that more reliable techniques wouldn't? I mean, for me, it's about space to deviate from practiced ways of thinking. Uh, that would be my summary, that I think sometimes we are quite, um, we're sort of trained and controlled into producing things in a cer certain versions of things in certain ways in education. And so I think these unreliable kind of co qualities for me open up a space for something which perhaps hasn't even yet been thought of. And that feels important, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I didn't want to ask my question. That was such a good question. So. <laughs> can ask anything. Else? Don't mind. No, it's, just, um, it's not so much a question, it's just a thought that came into my head. Thank you. Um, the first thing is that um, it seems to me that, that the maps that the children, yeah, the children, that any of us would produce, are a form of communication. It's a way of communicating something that's in one mind to another that differs from words or photos or you know. It's, mm. um, so I was interested in what you thought of that, mm. but it also, from that, I kind of one of the things about unreliability and reliability is that. What you're doing is to, is very individual to the person. They they're expressing themselves in through channels that you've mm. given them. Um, so every expression is different because it's a different person looking at the world in a different way. Is that what you mean by unreliable? Partly, I guess. I guess it leaves open that sort of difference that is there in the world and if those students did the, the maps today it would be different again yeah. and that's um yeah that's that's interesting and important to me um i think that um i agree it's an expression it's a communication it's but for me it's an express type of expression that is embodied <coughs> as well as cognitive like it's not just about what you're thinking a lot of the students said they were they felt like they were physically walking down their neighborhood roads thinking about the place and so it's accessing kind of different types of knowledge. And I'm also interested in how it can be expression and transformation at the same time, that actually through expressing your kind of sense making and imagining other possibilities and, um, and that's, that sort of process. My, I haven't talked about it much in the presentation, but I actually frame my research as to do with everyday creative thinking, because I think often we sort of talk about creative thinking as kind of producing new things actually I think it's the process of that sort of expression and change which um, often I think we don't get a chance in schools to really engage in and the world is very kind of it's right or it's wrong yeah. and so yeah thanks for that comment that's really helpful any more questions from go um, I just wanted to respond because there were lots of feelings I had when I was listening to it um, firstly about how the process over the outcome. I thought that was really interesting because going through education for me, I felt like outcome was always the big sort of focus. And just listening to you talk about it made me feel like there was a sense of success and failure, which was very prominent at school, sort of fading from this as, a, as, a, as an outcome. There is no failure to, the pro to any process, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but I think also I found it quite hard to understand because I feel like I am really conditioned by an outcome structure. So I'm all the way through it, I'm thinking, yeah, but how's that? How can we measure this? <laughs> so, you know, I'm constantly being like, yeah, but where's the, where's the roof? Mm. You know, because that's mm. just what I'm used to mm. dealing with when I'm sort of learning. Um, so I guess my question comes from that conditioning, which is where, 
where do you measure the, not the success and the failing, but the kind of things that work and things that don't work, and how do you rationalize that within a process model, mm. I guess? Good, yeah, it's really good thoughts, and actually really resonates with what came out of the workshop. So one of the chapters I want to write is about redefining right and wrong, and it was a theme that really came out of the students talking about that there's other possibilities and some of them would come in and say oh I've been looking at we were given a text to read in psychology and I've actually gone and looked up five other things I could read you know they kind of it felt like it was almost like they'd realized there wasn't just one way and it's you know it sounds tricky but I think that is how it feels sometimes in those environments when you're kind of being driven towards a particular outcome um, so I just yeah it's, I want to be really clear that I'm really interested in like holding the two things in tension, you know, producing outcomes and structured ways of working and then more free and open and like, you know, I, I'm not sort of advocating for one or other extre extreme in any sense. So, um, so there is a place for kind of producing things and, and looking at that outcome and considering how it's successful in what ways. But I think, I think what, it's come from my own experience, really. What I think is really missing is that sense of what, what we gain from just doing and thinking, you know, thinking rather than working towards something and what we miss if we don't engage in that. And it's more than just, because there is a thing like metacognition like, and reflection in education. There's a lot of emphasis on that. But I tend, tend to think it only happens after something's been done. And then students are asked to go back, think about their process, what would they have done differently? Whereas what I'm interested in, actually, the process, if you allow it, this freedom kind of offers you a different type of learning that you don't get in other ways. So, um, but I think it is that, that balance. And that I draw a lot upon the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. And, and he talk, you know, a lot of the ideas I talk about come from that, about this idea that there's structure and then there's a kind of more free, um, curious way of engaging with the world and it's about opening up education as it's got to at this point in our lives to allow for a bit more of that I think yeah thank you and I think we had one more from online um, this is a question from Jill Wildman um, you took much care of the students in helping them to take risks what do you think now about the risks you personally took with this exploratory process? <laughs> Thanks, Jill. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, uh, one of my colleagues visited the space and asked me how I prepare, and it, it sparked quite a lot of thoughts, which probably would answer this question. Um, it, for me, it was an equally exciting and frightening process from the kind of just the, the risk of kind of, as a designer who loves Excel, I mean, if you saw the way I work, you'd be surprised that I'm talking about such freedom sometimes. But, um, you know, I love organizing things. I love playing things through in my mind so that I feel sure that it's all going to work out. Um, and so I suppose for me, I had to really question those practices. I had to really think, actually, don't say more, you know, sit with the uncomfortableness and I had to find ways of um, you know giving students a helpful shrug a caring shrug of like see what happens rather than oh let me help you you know in teacher mode kind of when I think about the way I might have worked as a teacher so I think it's been a lot of kind of talking to myself about these ideas and saying well actually you know you be confident to let it happen this is what you're talking about let's see um, and I think through collaborations as well during the last couple of years, I've sort of learned that everything's interesting, <laughs> you know, that happens and having more assurances. But I'd also say that a big part of the safety, if you like, or the kind of trust that happened was the physical space. And I'm... Um, you know, not to labour the kind of love for the PM studio and the watershed, but without that space, I wonder, you know, or a space like that. And it makes me think about classrooms, about how we use them and how we organise them so that physically you're supported to take these risks. I felt physically supported because we were surrounding ourselves with the material. It felt productive and interesting. There was an energy that was created. 
um, rather than we were talking earlier about displays in classrooms that tend to have an example of what a seven looks like and what an eight looks like. That's the old fashioned C, B and A for anyone that doesn't know that it's now numbers. But you know, kind of what this, this is what your outcome should look like. Well, if, there were, if physically the space supported risk taking as well, I think um, that, that played a part. So, but yeah, it was, I mean, um, as anyone who, who spoke to me during those weeks, they know that this was a completely immersive and very kind of like a personal journey for me as well, because it really did test my own practices. And as I'm becoming a researcher, it was a really fascinating process to be researching alongside 17 year olds who were, were just amazing at researching and being inquisitive and curious about what was happening. Um, so it was kind of like a mutual yeah, learning process. Any more questions? I did have one question myself. Uh, so maybe I'm showing my age here, but like when I grew up, a map was a static thing that lived on paper. And I assume for most of these 17 year olds, their main experience of maps is mm. something that you swipe and zoom on your phone. I was wondering how that played into how they thought about mm. these kind of map making. Mm. Yeah, like as a representation of the world. Yeah, which is commonly we sort of, um, if, without taking a critical stance, that's what a map is for us, isn't it? It's a kind of fixed representation. So, um, you know, I, I know or um, that it can be quite challenging to sort of be asked to do a map, draw a map as well. I think that's why I started with something quite comfortable for them. Draw what's in your mind. I'm not asking you to show me what, what Montpellier really looks like or, um, you know, draw what's in your mind. And one of them did sit, look up at that point and say, there's, there's, so there's no right answer. And I went, no, there's no right. You know, that was kind of the beginning of the dialogue, really. Um, and I think it was interesting because I think I never had that conversation with them about how they felt about that, definite, that understanding of maps. But I did think about how most of their experiences is Google or Apple Maps, which are so ubiquitous, aren't they, and kind of devoid of experience or emotion or anything. <laughs> and I did think whether they thought they were part of the same group of <laughs> items, and how they, which I never asked that question, which would have been really fascinating. Um, but I certainly, th I certainly think they and we enjoyed that sort of understanding that maps are not the object, but the relationship between the person, the object, and the place. And that's a learn. I think that's something that felt learnt through the process and sort of was something that came into the conversations. Um, you might see maps differently. There's a reference on their kitchen and dodge, and they were the first kind of social scientists to really engage with this idea that maps are continuously mapping and that, that you know, that the world isn't fixed and correct um, or static. So, you know, a kind of map isn't either and it's that sort of, it's what you bring to it. Thank Thanks, Martin. Oh, one last one. The slides you showed us, are they available? This is recorded. Yeah, so I'm happy to make the slides available. I could do that through my website as a, if anyone was interested, yeah. Yeah, the students have given me permission to share, so which I'm really grateful for. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before you all go, a quick reminder, take a look at our website. We've got a range of great events coming up, including our 15th birthday celebration on the 3rd of February, right here. There's going to be something in this space it's going to be very impressive um i'm not sure what it is yet um we'll be showing lots of exciting work from the past decade and a half of the studio uh i just can't say uh more details all of that is on the website if you want to stick around in hot desk today uh find out more about what we do then please find one of the studio team studio team put your hand in the air great um and we'll be happy to help if you're watching online Drop us a line, studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions. Thank you all for being here today, and we'll see you all here next time. Thank you. There's, um, if anyone does want to see the reading, it's just there, and you're welcome to take a sheet. <laughs> <laughs>